thank you for joining me today. I know there are a few other really fun um, sessions going on at the same time, so I appreciate you taking the time uh, to be here with me. I'm here today from the Wikimedia Foundation. It's the foundation behind Wikipedia. And um, as mentioned in my introduction, I started about a month ago. So nine months ago when this planning started, I was still at Tesla Motors. I was there for about four and a half years. And um, when I started, the company was about 600 employees. Four and a half years later, <laughs> it was more than 13,000. It was a lot of fun running analytics and HR operations. I also ran systems at Tesla. So all of that was really interesting um, with rapid change happening every month, every year. Today I'm here uh, to talk about the referral program that I was involved in at Tesla Motors. And you will notice that the title of the presentation, the warrior, the craft, and the wild card, uh, slightly unique, and I'll tell you a story about that later. Here's the game plan for the next 25 to 30 minutes. I'll spend um, a few minutes telling you about myself, uh, a little bit about my story, and then um, I will spend a brief uh, minute or two talking about culture and why that is important. And then we'll get into the meat of the presentation, which is the referral program. And I'll tell you what we knew about the referral program, uh, what we didn't know about the referral program, and finally, what we found out. I'll end the presentation by uh, providing you with some tips, um, hopefully some useful things that you can uh, take back and apply at your company right away. And then, and then finally, we'll spend some time on Q&A. My story. <laughs> so to be perfectly honest with you, I'm actually surprised that I'm the VP of Human Resources at Wikimedia. <laughs> I think about that very often. I can't, I can't believe it. And, and the reason is because back in school, I never thought that my career will take me into human resources. I was really into numbers. I was into statistics. Um, I was so shy. If you met me 10 years ago, I barely put it, pulled it together to talk to one person. I, I would have never thought that I would stand in front of a room like that and not faint, basically. So, so shy, a real nerd. Um, so, but I did, res I did discover human resources through data, actually. I was an analyst and I was the first HR uh, people analyst at Tesla Motors and I slightly got into it and now I love it. I will spend my entire career doing this. I really do love it. But what I want to tell you is that my background is not very traditional. So I didn't go to school studying human resources. So a lot of people in this room probably know more about human resources or talent acquisition than I do. Um, I'm still making a lot of mistakes. Um, I think about my mistakes a lot so that I don't repeat them. And um, I think, though, because I don't have the background in hum human resources, I approach all the programs and initiatives that I roll out a little differently. So I don't know what traditional or what, what the program should look like. I go and analyze it and figure it out and roll out something that is outside of the box but it's not because I'm trying to be outside of the box. It's because I don't know what's in the box. I don't know what the traditional thing is. So I go out there and put something, oh, wow, that's very unique. Uh-huh, yeah, <laughs> not by design, but it comes out and it works. So I'll share some of the things, some of the mistakes I've made and some of the things that I found work. So my secret sauce, right? How come I have no background in HR and I've made it to be the v VP of HR now? Um, I tried to boil it, boil it down, and I think I finally figured it out. This is it. And if you know me, it's very typical that I put this on a graph. Uh, so about two years ago, I went to a class at Stanford. And um, what the class was saying is that if you take this, these two axes, this graph, you can plot any department at the company on here. 
So they said, on one axis, you will have things like feelings and words and policy, um, psychology. On the other axis, you will have numbers, hard stats, KPIs, just hard, hard data, right? I said, okay, that's, well, that's interesting. Where would I plot HR? And this graph is exaggeration. Obviously, there's nothing scientific. I'm just trying to illustrate a point. I thought, well, traditional HR, I will probably put up there, and it's probably too much up there. Um, why? Trained HR professionals are very good with words. They're very eloquent. I wish I was eloquent. I'm not. I'm just a nerd trying to survive, basically. But <laughs> they're very eloquent. They're very sensitive to um, to people, to people's feelings. They're very politically correct. Um, they love people. Uh, most HR professionals love people. <laughs> the majority do. So HR is up there, and then the business is down there. So when I say the business, what is that? That's engineering or manufacturing. In manufacturing, this is how many cars you need to produce. Uh, how are you gonna get there? Did you produce them? Or sales or service. So in sales, this is your quota. Did you get it? Did, did you hit the quota? Did you exceed it? So no wonder there is a natural tension between HR and the business, because the business always looks at HR and says, okay, well, HR, could you please back up what you're saying with some data? I know this is your opinion, but how, what are the numbers behind it? And then on the other side, you have HR saying, Okay, all you care um, is the numbers. And you really don't care about people. And people are the most important thing at the company. So, right? I think we've both heard variations of this on both sides. And the frustration is there on both sides. And it's because they don't speak the same language. So, because my background is in data, I did what was the easiest thing for me to do. I went and I hired me a team of data scientists. <laughs> Amazing people, right? Fancy schools in their background. They had 10, 15 years of statistics in their background. Genetics. They had patents out there. Truly amazing talent. I was so excited. So I had a team of that, and we started doing really cool stuff, and um, I was like, oh my God, we'll go out there and we'll impress everyone. And the model failed. Why did it fail? Uh, it failed because no one in HR actually understood what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> so uh, HR rejected my data scientist. Fine, okay, we're rejected by our own team. Let's go out and see if the, if the business um, cares. Um, so we go out and we are ready. We have these findings, we have some predictive modeling, all this stuff, and we will present it, let's say, to a manager. And then we go and we say, okay, well, do you have 90 minutes for us to go over all of this that we have found? And then the manager says, oh, okay, well, uh, interesting, but I'm really stressed out right now, and I have this guy on my team, John, and uh, John is trying to leave, and can you please tell me how to retain John right now? I need to solve this problem right now. And then we go and say, yeah, flight risk is calculated, but all these variables and the predictive model that we have created will tell you that for John, this variable is probably more significant than this. And then he'll say, okay, well, that's interesting. Um, can you tell me how to solve it right now? So what, what can I do to solve it right now? So, and then we sit there and we really don't have the, the solution. So, yeah, they were annoyed uh, by us uh, because our, our findings were important, they were predictive, but they're not practical. So what I learned is that I have to dial it down. So I dial it down. The winning zone, the secret sauce is somewhere in there. It's not on this side, it's somewhere in there and it varies by your audience, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's sales you're talking about. But what you need to do is back up the proposals that you have with some data or provide some data to show that you did your due diligence. Don't do too much, just do a little bit so that you speak the language of the business. Um, because and there, there is a message I have. Uh, 
data is a common language, right? So like music, data is a language that we all understand. If you have a scale from one to 10 and you, you say, okay, this program did five, then everyone knows what the program did. Uh, if you, any other words might be misunderstood. So numbers, I use numbers to communicate with the, with the business. And I actually use numbers because it's very comfortable for me to provide the numbers and then speak about the numbers versus come with an opinion and if they attack me, I go, oh, I'm not very good at convincing them just with words. So I use numbers that um, sometimes are good, sometimes are bad, but they are what they are and I provide the recommendation what we're gonna do about it. This is my secret sauce. So let's spend a moment on culture. Why is culture important? How does it relate to the referral program? Culture is important always, basically. Any presentation that I ever do starts with this slide. Why does it start with this slide? I will, I am about to go in and tell you what I did uh, with the referral program and what I found out, and that worked or that was the case because of Tesla. Um, you could take that model, that recipe, apply it at your company, it could be completely wrong. So I want you to see what I have to say, but then think about how to tweak it or repurpose it for your environment so it's right and successful for you. In fact, I could take what I did at Tesla and Im implement right now at the Wikimedia Foundation and it could be a complete disaster. So you have to always think about the culture and um, what the environment is before you do anything. So let's go quickly through what the cultural pillars were at uh, Tesla. <laughs> One, everyone at Tesla wants to be competitive and the best at everything that they do. Surprise! <laughs> Have, people actually really mean this, and it sounds like this horrible competitive environment, but it's not. It's a fun competitive environment. Um, it's a fun competitive environment only if you're okay with the fact that you're not always going to be the smartest person in the room. If you have this strong desire to always be the smartest person in the room every single time, then you're gonna have a really tough time. So if you're humble and just want to contribute, it's, it's a fun environment. Now number two, no fear of solving hard problems yourself. So what this is saying is uh, try to not outsource thing, things, try to insource them. And then three, oh, three was really important for me, be resourceful. What that means is there's no budget. That, that's what it really means. <laughs> so be resourceful. Uh, there is a budget at Tesla for design and engineering. There is a budget for manufacturing, production of the car, and there's a budget of sales and service. There's never a budget for HR. There's never going to be a budget for HR. So <laughs> in the beginning, I was really frustrated by that. Well, how am I supposed to do anything? I don't have a budget. But then with time, I actually learned to appreciate it because it taught me um, useful skills that I can apply in the real world. How many companies out there in the real world have a huge HR budget? Uh, not very many. Most companies don't have an HR budget. I mean, the presentation before me, right? No budget. It's, it's, we all work for HR. There's always a limited or no budget at all. So what it helped me though is again, think outside of the box. I, I figured uh, creative ways of solving things. I used uh, free trials I downloaded from the internet. I used uh, models that I repurposed from other, um, from other disciplines. I repurposed tools that they had used for something else before. So it just forces you to be creative and make things work. And then when you have some uh, lessons learned or some things that work, then you can also tell them to your colleagues and they can use them too, rather than say, well, we don't have the budget to go and do that. So it's, it's good, it's, it's okay to not have a budget. And then number four, just get it done. Try to minimize bureaucracy. So this goes along with Tesla trying to keep that startup culture. And then number five, try to be sustainable. Try to be green, just like the product. And then number six, work hard. So to scale, scale the company that quickly in four years, we had to work so, so hard. And it was fun, so we had some fun. So these are the cultural values. When I, first, when I was first introduced to uh, the referral program, 
I think it, it, it had been around for about 18 months. Um, someone else was managing the referral program and I was helping with data here and there, depending on what she needs. And the program was very, it, it was very good. It was going very well. We we're advertising it. So we knew that 20% of new hires come from the referral program. We knew that um, in manufacturing, manufacturing associates did recommend or refer a lot of just a high volume um, of people and then not a high percentage got hired. We knew that in engineering, they referred a few people, but they were really thoughtful about their referrals, so almost everyone got hired. Then sales and service, g &A kind of in between those two extremes. And then we knew that in North America, the program was doing very well. Um, in Europe, it was really amazing. So the employee population was really engaged. They loved it. And then we knew that in APAC, it was really missing in action. So we were kind of brainstorming, what can we do to um, get the engagement up there a little more? So 20% of new hires came from the referral program. And then they asked us a question. So if 20% come from the referral program, can you tell me if they're any good? So are they any good? I have no idea, right? I ha I've never thought about this. Are they any good? Well, of course they're good because they go through our rigorous uh, recruiting process, so therefore they must be good. Okay, well, okay, I guess they're good, but how about some follow-up questions? They ha they're wondering, how about time to fill for referrals? Is it um, shorter or longer? How about the cost? Are referrals cheaper? than a hire coming from the pipeline. How about diversity? Are you bringing in more diversity through the referral program or less? <laughs> no idea. Um, how about social dynamics? Do people refer people uh, cross-functionally or do they refer them into their own department? How about managers? Do they refer people for their own team? Do they help other managers build their team? No idea. Um, how about retention? How about performance? We, we didn't have, we didn't have answers to all this. We never thought about it. Why is that? Because people um, measure and track what's easy. They don't do, they don't track and measure what's important. I did the same mistake. So me coming from a data background, I did the same mistake, very easy. It's very easy for me to calculate that 20% come from the referral program. Here's my pool of new hires. These came from the referral program, 20%. <laughs> this takes a lot of work. I have to go put all this data together. I have to think about it. Um, I don't have data. But this is w what is very important. So this is the message, right? The message is don't only measure what's easy, measure what's important. In fact, you should measure both. So the 20% volume, that is an important number even though it's easy to measure. But this is also very important, so don't forget about that. So we want to answer some of the, these questions, and so what did we do? Big data. <laughs> big data is the answer to everything nowadays. Everyone talks about big data. No one knows what it means. <laughs> okay, some people know what it means. Um, <laughs> there are multiple definitions out there. One definition is big data is this huge, giant body of unstructured data. You need some serious tools in order to make some sense out of it and get some findings out. That's one definition. Another definition is just a big, just huge amount of data. So data going this way, right? Rows and rows and rows of data. There's another definition of big data. I have my own definition. I came up, <laughs> this is funny, I have my own definition of big data. My husband finds that really funny because a lot of times I say something and he says, honey, you know that's not really a word in English, right? <laughs> and I say, why not? And then he says, well, because it isn't. It j it's just not a word. And then I say, well, but maybe it is now because that's how um, language evolves. So <laughs> this is the word. So if you're wondering what it means, you can ask me. <laughs> and he says, okay, whatever. All right, so same thing about big data. Here's my definition. Uh, so the, the, my definition of big data is data going this way, right? So normally data going this way. Data going this way, 
doesn't have to be very deep. It has to be very wide. So what I mean by that is you take the referrer, the employee that's partic participating in the program, and you take the person that they have referred. So because the referrer is an employee at your company, you already have a lot of data about them, data such as who they report to, what the department is they're in, business unit, um, what's their gender, what's their diversity, what, what's their ethnicity, um, what's their performance score, what is the trend of the performance. You keep building as much as you can. You just keep adding to it. And then on the other side, if they referred someone and that person got hired, you can start compiling the data here as well, right? What department did they get hired in? Who was the manager? What is the performance? You start tracking performance over time. What is their gender? What is their uh, ethnicity? So you build out big data. You just build out the data set as big as you can. And you don't have to do anything fancy. You don't have to go and hire a um, database specialist or a data scientist. You can do, um, just, you can just get an intern or someone that's interested in this and they can copy paste. They just put it all together as big as possible. And then you start analyzing that thing to get some of the answers. So here's some of the answers we found. Yes, the time to fill for referrals is much shorter than um, someone that wasn't a referral. That's not a surprise. The cost, yes, referrals are much cheaper than um, regular hires from the pipeline. Diversity. The diversity one was interesting because the diversity of the referral population coming in actually matches the diversity of the population that referred them. That's no surprise. There's a lot of research out there. People refer people that, like, that are like them. People like people that are like them. It's just a very common psychological phenomenon. Um, so, okay, well, the diversity is the same as the diversity of the population. That's so boring. It's not really boring because what you can do is, if you want to get fancy, you take a look at who is currently engaged, the diversity of the currently engaged population. And you can predict what is going to happen to your workforce tomorrow as they are basically putting in this new source of people, right? Or if you don't like what is happening, then you can think about how to engage certain parts of the population, to increase diversity. It's up to you. But now you know the trend, so now you can go and do whatever. We didn't do anything around diversity through the referral program at Tesla Motors, but it was an interesting trend that we found. The most interesting things I thought were around retention, around the social dynamics, and finally around performance, the performance of the people coming in. Retention. When it comes to retention, the referral program is a gold mine. Love it. it it's so good. It's not only good for your current employee population, it's also good for the people that come in coming in. These are some things that we found. Referrals stay longer. So if I came in through the referral program as a referral, I'm likely to stay longer at the company than if I was just a regular hire. And then the second thing we found is that employees that refer stay longer. So if I'm actively participating in the program referring people, I'm likely to stay longer than my colleagues that are not probably has to do something with engagement and them trying to help you build the company. And then finally, successful referrals of referrers stay longer. So if I refer my buddy and my buddy gets hired, I'm likely to stay longer than if I referred my buddy and my buddy didn't get hired. We thought about this. There are a lot of reasons why that might be happening. Well, there's like psychology, something in psychology called a familiar is beautiful. So Maybe as they're building their network of, of friends at work, you see those familiar faces, you feel happier at work. Uh, the other thing we thought about, well, maybe it feels uncomfortable if you sold the company to all your friends. <laughs> they joined, and now you bounce and go to another company and have to tell them, oh, yeah, welcome, and I'm going to leave. So th there are different things going on. And I actually wrote a whole blog about this because we thought it was really interesting. It's, on, it's posted on LinkedIn. So... When it comes to retention, the referral program is really good. This is the other thing that we found around performance. So this is where the story about the warrior, the crab, and the wild card comes. We made these things up. Um, the trend, we didn't make the trend up, we made up the names. 
So A players refer A players. B players refer C players. This is really important. So A player. A player is a performer um, that is based on your performance curve. So at Tesla, we rated performance on the performance curve. So your top five to 10% are A players. That person refers the best people that they know. We call them warriors because if you're recruiting, trying to go to war, and you ask uh, people, the warriors on your army, to go refer someone, so another warrior, who are they gonna refer? They're gonna refer the best person that they know. They're going to war. They're not gonna refer someone that's bad. No, they're going together, right? Okay, this is a little bit of exaggeration. You can also think though, maybe it's the war for talent, maybe it's we're going to war against the competition. We made this up, maybe it's not the ideal name, but you get the idea. They refer, they sit there and they refer the best person that they know for the job. And then the B player. B player is the crab, why? Um, we're asking the crab to refer someone and the crab is so close to get, getting that trophy. They're so close to the top. Who are they gonna refer? They're not gonna refer someone that is as good as them, that's gonna make it even harder to get that trophy. They're gonna refer someone that's worse, that's gonna make them look better. So maybe they get the trophy. Why the crab? I was imagining a bucket of crabs. How does the crab get up to the top of the bucket? They crawl up and they pull everyone else down on the way up. So this is the little visual. I don't know if the crab is doing this intentionally or unintentionally. I was surprised by this trend, but this trend is actually not surprising. I did research and it looks like this trend is there in a lot of different disciplines and there are a lot of different settings and environments. It's just human nature. Maybe it has to do with the competitive environment at Tesla. That's what I'm saying. Maybe this trend is not going to be the same at your company. You have to go and figure if, if it's true. But it was true for us. The C player is a wild card. That makes sense. They refer A, B, or C players. So why this is so problematic is that if you look at that curve of performance, most of your employees or most of our employees were B players and C players. They're still good talent, but they're put or rated in those categories, right? So you have 10 to 20%, let's say, that's standard for the B players and then 30 to 50 for the C players or kind of core talent of the company. So if all that, th this mass of people is recommending people that are potentially worse than them, then over time, your referral program is actually decreasing the talent bar at your company. That is horrible. There is no gold mine. That's a really bad program. It's not really bad program. It's not bad if you know about this trend and if you're keeping an eye on it and managing it. So you have to constantly take a look how this is playing out. So first thing we taught, natural reaction, ban everyone that's a B player and C player out of this race. No referrals for you. <laughs> that's, that's obviously, you can't do that. Why would you do that? What you can do is try to influence and motivate people to do the right thing. Um, so take a positive approach. Maybe you go and thank everyone that has referred to, um, top performers. Or maybe you go and tell them about some of these dynamics. You're, you're not gonna say it's dumb, but they know that it may be dumb. So you just inform people and you try to manage the program. But we weren't doing anything like that. We were not rewarding people. We were not aware that people may potentially be referring people that are slightly um, lower caliber than them before that. So we were not doing anything about this. And it was really important to do something about it. So what are my takeaways? I try to be practical. Remember, showing off is not helpful to anyone, so give that up a long time ago. We'll never do it again. You just try to be practical. Um, what I recommend is uh, go back and take a look at what you're measuring. See if you're doing it just because it's easy and think about what questions you want to answer and what you actually need to measure to answer those questions. So start thinking about creating those new fields 
and start tracking that data. So that will take a little bit of time. It will take time to create the field, to come up with, with the field, create the field, and then track the data. So it will take a few months. You should still do that because it's important. But what you can do immediately when you go back is go and download all the data that you have, any kind of data, and then create your big data, right? Remember, just add all the variables that you have. You might have to get them from different systems. Uh, you might have to, you have to basically kind of Frankenstein it together. You don't need the data scientist, again, to do this. You just, you just get someone that is interested in this program or an intern or someone that is good in Excel, copy paste, whatever it takes, put it together, and then analyze to see what the trends are in your environment. So it's very important for you to know. Some trends might be really boring. Okay, yeah, I knew that. Some trends might be really shocking. Um, some things will come out that you were not looking for. They will surprise you. Your findings might be completely different than what we have here. It doesn't matter. You will know what it is, and then you can manage it. Right? So once you know what it is, then you can maybe try to increase the percentage of the new hires, right? I think we will always do that Tesla because I really think that the referral program is a really important program and a program that has a lot of potential. So increase the percentage, increase the quality, use it for, so use it for hiring pushes, right? Use it for diversity. Use it for recognition. Recognize those people that are referring the top performers. They should get a sense of pride uh, that, that they've done that. They're actively helping you shape the company. It, it's, it's actually amazing. They don't have to do this. They're doing it. Some people do it because of the referral bonus. Some people do it because they're really proud to help refer someone that's really good. And then use it as an engagement tool. This is all I had today. I have my contact info here in case you want to email me. Uh, but if it's a question you want to share with everyone here, now is the time. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, that's interesting. One, one second. Can you uh, repeat that in the microphone? Just before we leave that? Oh. So as I said, um, so when initially you, you would have that referral, uh, if that referring candidate or uh, employee left the company, would he then pull those referrals out? Yeah. Um, we didn't look into that. Um, it's very important. We thought about it. It's also you should take a look at the referrals of people that were ter terminated, right? The data set wasn't very, wasn't very large, so we can't look at any like, meaningful trends. Maybe over time, as Tesla grows, there will be something interesting there. But I think it's really important. Um, it had all, it has, it, it's again, with the social dynamics, right? It comes, it, it's around social dynamics. And exactly when do they make the referral, if then they take the referral with them, uh, is it like two years ago or anyway we I don't I didn't have an answer for that basically we didn't look at it because the data wasn't there that there was not enough data there was some data yeah we got microphones in the aisles too you guys line up What do you do about, uh, we've tried harder in our company to recognize people that refer other people, um, you know, thank them for their referral, let them know how the referral is doing during the process, all those good things that we weren't doing, which is certainly very helpful. But what do you do about somebody who refers 50 different people every time there's a job opening and they're never anywhere near qualified um, for the type of position that they're doing. I mean, it's unfortunate. We've really pushed yeah. to try to get people to refer, but it doesn't seem like we've got the right people that are doing the referring. Oh, I see. Yes. 
It's, it, first of all, it's very good that you are trying to thank them. A lot of people just get the referral, pay them the bonus, and so this is really kind of best practice. It's great. But we saw some of that in our data, and especially when I was talking about manufacturing. We saw it in manufacturing. A lot of people just do it for the bonus, so it's almost like a lottery. Um, we have employees that sit there all weekend long and refer random people off LinkedIn. They don't even know the person. And they just said, they have great work, uh, like um, ethics, or like the great worker. And then it's like, okay, you really, you just refer 30 people today. You don't know any of these people. I see that you're doing it every weekend. <laughs> we have some of that. Can't ban them. What we actually looked at though, then the success of their referrals is almost non-existent. They refer all these people and then almost no one gets hired. So the person gets hired sometime, it's just lucky. So what I noticed is over time, they start referring less. So they spend a bunch of weekends doing this and they're like, oh God, I'm just gonna go and enjoy barbecue. This, 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 this. No. So the trend for us was self-correcting. I don't know how much you see of it, and if you take a look, take a look to see if over time it will self-correct. If it doesn't, maybe it's a conversation what the person's saying. Um, or the other thing that we did is we put the category in where you have to say, it, before it was, it was not mandatory, then we made it mandatory where you say how you know the person. Then we actually put a category in, so it's like random, or like from LinkedIn or something, to tell them that we know so just small things to tell them that we know what you're doing. <laughs> we also put the limit to how much, so you can't just put, um, like, you can't put like one sentence in. So you have to do more. So you can play a little bit with that. Small tweaks, don't make it frustrating. Um, Thank you. Thanks, this is one of the best sessions I've been to. This is really helpful, oh, I appreciate it. thank you, I appreciate it. it. Um, so, when you determined the data that you hadn't been measuring and what was important and what you wanted mm -hmm. to measure on, yeah. I'm wondering if you went back historically mm -hmm. to pull that data, or did you strike a date and then begin tracking from that going forward? Um, what fields do you mean? So, what, what kind of the historical versus current? Um, when you were looking at mm -hmm. the uh, like tenure of employment for referrals mm -hmm. versus non-referrals, mm -hmm. or you know the data that you had mentioned. Yes, I see. Yeah, I, I know what you're saying. It it depends on how much time you have, and it depends how big the population is. When we looked at this, the population at Tesla was not very big, and the people in the referral program were not very. It's not very many. So we did everything we could, including historical. We put it all together. But then when you put it together, back to the other point, some of the data then became so small that we couldn't really do anything with it, but we did take the time and put everything we could together. It will depend on your environment. If it's a very small population and you feel like it's manageable to put it together, then fine. I don't think you should spend more than two, three weeks putting your data together. Don't do it like for nine months so at the end of it you have your data set and you're kind of over this. Right? So just um, figure out your best, um, kind of your best data set, depending on what you have on hand. And then my second follow-up question yeah. is: um, so a person coming from talent acquisition and then going to our HRAS team and saying, "Hey, I just went to this LinkedIn conference and I really would like to measure this data. Uh -huh. um, how do I get them on board with that?" Yeah, I know. That was my question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You can see I'm a very honest person, so I'll tell you what really happened. What really happened is that, yes, it's very painful to go and, and they say no. And it, um, that's why I became the head of HR, the HRS. <laughs> because over time, like I just, in order to do analysis, I need to be the one designing what the fields are we're gonna do analysis. Otherwise, I'm just spending my time pitching that we need to add this field. But this is not typical. Having HRS, analytics, and ops under one umbrella is not typical. Normally, it's either on another team or it's in IT. 
what I've done in the past, I've had both cases where a Tesla, actually some of it went to IT over time, like the security and admin, because our referral program was also an in-house build tool. So that was really people that were coding. So it was in IT, and then in my previous company, Brocade, um, it was in a whole different um, department. The truth is, I make friends with them. I go and bribe them with cupcakes. <laughs> I figure out uh, Gonzalo at the current company, he's really into soccer. I figured out like how to get him soccer-related bribing. Uh, uh. <laughs> There's no other way. You can't force them. You have to make friends, and you have to really figure out. The yeah, you got to figure out how to make it happen. It's painful. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, um, I appreciate your humor. <laughs> yeah. it, uh, I think we all have to have uh, a sense of humor at times. Um, yeah. So as far as rewarding employees for referrals, can you talk about that? Because I know we have a program and you know, the feedback is, oh, it's really not enough money, uh, doesn't oh. really motivate me. So yeah. can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, when they start talking about the bonus, then it's, a, and it's in a really bad place if they're really focusing on the amount of the bonus. You should be able to do this something. You can, the bonus should be able to be 100 or 300 bucks and they should still do it. You don't have to do what Google does with like I think 7,000 or some huge amount. I don't know how much it is Google. It's much more. A Tesla it barely, it's almost like, it's like the smallest amount ever. Um, we found that, um, we actually, we do have the amount in place, but then we did other things like pins uh, or gift cards. Uh, just um, we were thinking about almost like a certificate. Um, so you need to get out, somehow you need to help them get out of that mental space that it's all about the bonus. It's not about the bonus. You're actually helping shape this company. So you need to really talk about that because depending on how big the company is and where they're referring into, they're basically now having a say in how the company is going to look. They're creating their own environment. They're creating um, basically whether this is going to be a successful company or not. So they need to, the bonus should be um, like an afterthought. It shouldn't be the first thing. So I think you need to figure out ways to engage and teach them about all these other non-monetary things that they will be winning. Think about it, if they refer someone in IT, Let's say that person that creates the field in IT is their buddy that they referred in. How, I mean, how that's, that's money right there, right? So what they're doing is as they're referring people on their team, they're creating a good environment on them. As they're uh, referring people cross-functionally, they're creating friends to be more successful in their job. So you start talking to them about all these other benefits. The benefits are there. They just never talk. They don't think about it. They don't really see them as real benefits. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much.